ಓಕೆ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ನಾನು ಬೆಂಗಳೂರಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಅಂತ ಕನ್ನಡಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾತಾಡೋಣ ಅಂದ್ಕೊಂಡೆ ಕನ್ನಡ ಇಲ್ಲೇ ಅದು ನನ್ನ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಸುಜಾತ ಇನ್ನು ಯಾರು ಗೊತ್ತಿದೋ ಇಲ್ವೋ ಗೊತ್ತಾ ಹಾಂ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಆದರೆ ಕನ್ನಡಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾತಾಡಿದ್ರೆ ಕಸ್ಪಿಡಲ್ ಆಟೋಮೋಫಿಕ್ ರೆಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ಹೆಂಗೆ ಹೇಳಬೇಕು ನಂಗೆ ಗೊತ್ತಿಲ್ಲ ಸೊ ಐ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಔಟ್ ಟು ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಸೊ ಸೊ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಸ್ ಟು ದ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸರ್ಸ್ ದೇವರ್ಗ ಡೆನಿ ಚಿತ್ರಭಾನು ನರಸಿಂಹಕುಮಾರ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಇನ್ವಿಟೇಷನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೈ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ವಿಸಿಟ್ ಟು ಐ ಸಿ ಟಿ ಎಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯಾಂಟಾಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಅಪ್ ವೆರಿ ವೆಲ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಅ ಸ್ಪಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಥ್ರಿಲ್ಡ್ ಟು ಸಿ ದಟ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅ ಪರ್ಸನಲ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಟು ಐ ಸಿ ಟಿ ಎಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಶ್ಯೂರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಡೋಂಟ್ ನೋ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಾಬಬ್ಲಿ ಐ ವಾಂಡರ್ ಇಫ್ ದ ಡಿರೆಕ್ಟರ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ನೋ ಸೊ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಗೋಂಗ್ ಟು ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಟೆಲ್ ಇಮ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೊ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಗೋ ಟು ದ ಲೈಬ್ರರಿ ಪಾಣಿನಿ ಲೈಬ್ರರಿ ಯು ಎಂಟರ್ ಟು ದ ಲೆಫ್ಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಬಸ್ಟ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ಗೋ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಲುಕ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಅನ್ಫಾರ್ಚುನೇಟ್ಲಿ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ನೇಮ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ನಥಿಂಗ್ ದೇರ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಬಸ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ಅ ವುಡನ್ ಪೆಡಸ್ಟಲ್ ನೋ ದಿಸ್ ಬಸ್ಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಹರೀಶ್ ಚಂದ್ರ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಥ್ರೀ ಕಾಪೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಬಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಅನ್ ಐಸರ್ ಪುಣೆ ದ ಅದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅಡ್ವಾನ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಇನ್ ದ ಲೈಬ್ರರಿ ಇನ್ ಫುಲ್ಡ್ ಹಾಲ್ ಇನ್ ದ ನಾರ್ತ್ ರೂಮ್ ವೇರ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಫೆಮಿಲಿಯರ್ ವಿನ್ ಅವರ್ ದ ನ್ಯೂ ಜರ್ನಲ್ಸ್ ಅರೈವ್ ಸೊ ಅಟ್ ಸಮ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೈಮ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಅನ್ ಐಸರ್ ಐಮ್ ಸುಲ್ ಇನ್ ಐಸರ್ ವೆನ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ದ ಹೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಮ್ಯಾಥ್ ಇನ್ ಐಸರ್ ಐ ವಾಂಟೆಡ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ರಾಮಾನುಜನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹರೀಶ್ ಚಂದ್ರ ಸೊ ಐ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ಇಮೇಲಿಂಗ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಅರೌಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಮನ್ ಸಜೆಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ದಟ್ ಶಾರ್ಲೆಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಲಿನ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಸ್ಕಲ್ಪ್ಟ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಶುಡ್ ಅಪ್ರೋಚ್ ಹರ್ ಟು ಮೇಕ್ ಅ ಬಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಹರೀಶ್ ಚಂದ್ರ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ಅರೌಂಡ್ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಾರ್ನಾಕ್ಸ್ ಬರ್ತ್ ಡೇ ಕಾನ್ಫ್ರೆನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ಪ್ರಿನ್ಸ್ಟನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೇಡ್ ಅನ್ ಅಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಐ ವೆನ್ ಟು ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಲಿನ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಗ್ರೌಂಡ್ ಫ್ಲೋರ್ ಒನ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಹರ್ ಸ್ಟುಡಿಯೋ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ನೈಸ್ ಮೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೊ ಶೀ ಡಿಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಫ್ರೀ ಫಾರ್ ಅಸ್ ಇನಿಷಿಯಲಿ ದೇರ್ ವರ್ ಟೂ ಕಾಪೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಎಟ್ ಐಸರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಒನ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ನೌ ಗೋಪಾಲ್ ಪ್ರಸಾದ್ ಸಾ ದ ಒನ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೀ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಸಮ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಷನ್ ವಿತ್ ಐ ಸಿ ಟಿ ಎಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯೆಟ್ ಅನ್ ಅದರ್ ಬ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ ಕಾಪಿ ವಾಸ್ ಮೇಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ನೋ ವಿ ಓ ದಿಸ್ ಟು ಶಾಲೆಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಶಿ ಮೇಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಮೆಮರೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಹರೀಶ್ ಚಂದ್ರ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಹು ಆರ್ ನೋನ್ ಹರೀಶ್ ಚಂದ್ರ ಸೇ ದಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಇಮೇಜ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಬಸ್ಟ್ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದೇ ಟೇಕ್ ಎ ಫೋಟೋಗ್ರಾಫ್ ಕಮ್ ಟು ಐಸರ್ ಗೋ ಟು ದ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ನೋ ಓಕೆ ಐ ಸೊ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ವ್ಯಾಲ್ಯೂಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಲ್ ಫಂಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಮೋಟಿವೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ಮೇ ಹಿಯರ್ಸ್ ಅನದರ್ ಟ್ರಿವಿಯ ದಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಹಿಯರ್ ಶುಡ್ ನೋ ದಿಸ್ ರೂಮ್ ಇಸ್ ನೇಮ್ಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಮಾಧವ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಮಾಧವ ಆಫ್ ಕೇರಳ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಮ್ಯಾಥಮ್ಯಾಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಕ್ಲೇಮ್ಸ್ ಟು ಫೇಮ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ this sums to 5 by 4 this now if you google this you'll see this it's called madhava leibniz series uh so there's actually a 14th century theorem and of course we recognize this as the value of the l function dirichlet l function attached to the quadratic dirichlet
the Peterson norm of the modular form of larger weight and the Gauss sum of the Nevin typus of the character of the smaller weight modular form. So there's a theorem like this. In particular, if I suppose uh, this uh, strip is, has some space, now if I take, uh, so as a corollary, if I take, let's say, uh, L less than or equal to M, which is less than M plus one, and which is uh, both of them critical, so M and M plus one critical, and I divide the value at M by the value at M plus one, then all these terrible quantities like the Peterson norm, all this cancel out. What remains is uh, one over two pi i squared. The Gauss sum also cancels out. And now you have to remember that in Shimura, so this is this, you know, uh, the finite part of the L function. So I'll put a finite. And this is a four, i square is minus one, what remains is a pi square, and that's exactly the contribution of the corresponding ratio of the gamma factors at infinity that you throw in for the completed L function. So it follows that if I, if I, I'm, I'm sort of using an automorphic notation that L without any qualification is the completed L function. So if I look at the completed L value, the, the ratio, or I won't write this as a ratio, one, is an, the ratio is algebraic and actually lives in the corresponding number field, or if I go from one to the next uh, critical value, no new transcendental quantities need to be introduced. So stated this way, there is, you know, I don't need to invoke uh, periods. So the purpose of this talk, so some kind of my take home message for you is, uh, I have been studying in various contexts rationality results for successive successive critical values of L functions, automorphic L functions. So yes, yeah, yeah. So I said it without uh, writing. I will put down a precise theorem when I state, uh, so this is up to a quantity uh, which lives in the number field obtained by adjoining the Fourier coefficients of f and g. The objects I start with, if they're reasonably good, they give you a certain uh, field, uh, your rationality field. Yes, yes. So all the strong versions are <laughs> going to come up, so I'm still motivating my, yeah. So as, uh, Dishal, it said, so this ratio, uh, the way Shimura put this, is not only is it algebraic, it's so maybe this ratio, is not only algebraic, it's Galois equivariant in some precise sense, and I'll put that down. Uh. So before I get into in my title and abstract, I said I'm going to talk about a certain project which involves the special values of L functions for orthogonal groups, but before I get into that, what I want to do is, you know, many people in this room have heard me give talks on these kind of matters over the last several years. on the third line. This one? Yes. Finite, it's a finite part. Summation A and B and by N to the S. Yeah, also completed by degree one. Yeah. The finite part of the L function. The Riemann zeta function is the finite part of the L function attached to, you know, your trivial motive. And Lambda s is for me the completed L function. This is pi to the minus s by two gamma s by two zeta s. So this is, you have to pick one notational uh, club. Uh, so for me, L is the complete L function. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, some scope of results that I have been thinking about. So for this, uh, I need a ambient reductive group G, a certain parabolic subgroup, maximal parabolic subgroup P, and its levy MP to state, uh, to give you a feel for uh, the scope of results uh, I have been involved with. So first, this is my work with uh, Gunter Harder. Uh, we studied L functions for GLN cross GLN prime. 
Uh, this is over a totally real field. This is a levy in a parabolic, maximal parabolic, where the ambient group G is a uh, GL capital N. And to see this sort of a formal relation, I would need to take N and N prime both E1. And then uh, for this parabolic, you know, I'm, I'm going to put down some Dinkin diagrams. I've just, this is my Dinkin diagram uh, for a maximal parabolic. And the L function is uh, the classical rankin selberg function. This is what Harder and I studied over the course of a decade. It's now completed. This is going to appear as a volume in Annals of Math Studies. It should be out in a couple of months. After this, I looked at something which looks very similar. The groups at least look very similar, but the base field is now a totally imaginary field. This also looks the same. I'm also looking at rankin selberg functions. And you see, the when you look at the analytic theory, this is something I was having a conversation over lunch or dinner yesterday. The analytic theory of L-functions doesn't care so much about the base field. You look at Jackie Langlands, they take a number field and you study automorphic forms in GL2, attach an L-function, functional equation, and what have you. But if you want to study the arithmetic of special values, the arithmetic of the base field plays a very serious role. Uh, this, this book is more than 200 pages, and this is another 50 pages to kind of pin down the details. And uh, there is no uh, restrictions on n and n prime. And there is a theorem of rationality result like this for successive L values. <clears throat> a third context, and this is what I'm going to be talking uh, about today, the details of this project. This is uh, for, I look at orthogonal groups, even orthogonal groups, cross GL1 or a totally real field. Here my ambient group is an orthogonal group of one sort of larger size, even orthogonal group of one larger size. And I also need to assume n is even. And my Dinkin diagram is this. I'm deleting this guy. Then I have a smaller orthogonal group, and this is the levy uh, of this for this parabolic. And here one gets theorems about the degree 2n standard Langlands L function uh, attached to this representations of this. And this is a project which is almost completed with a colleague of mine, Chandrashil Bhagwat. I'm expecting in another few weeks that we should have a preprint ready. We announced the results in Contourandu a couple of years ago. Uh, a different project is I look at, or I should say we look at, I'll tell you who the V is in a second, GLN over E cross GL1 over F, where E over F is a quadratic extension of totally real fields. An ambient group in which this guy sits as a levy is a unitary group. I'm going to take unitary group with similitudes, GUNN. And here again, uh, I need to assume n is even. The Dinkin diagram here is of this shape. The Galois action uh, identifies this with this, this with this, and so on. And this guy is getting deleted, and then after it gets deleted, this looks like GLN or a quadratic extension. And because I'm working with similitudes, there's an extra GL1 factor. And here, uh, one gets the degree n squared, uh, what's called the Asai L function. And with this extra GL1, there's a twisted, twisted Asai L functions. This is a project of mine with uh, Muthu Krishnamurti. at the University of Iowa. And there is a fifth context where one, this is still too nascent, but there are very interesting things going on. Uh, the levy is a spin 10. Actually, it's a spin 10 cross GL1 mod a diagonal uh, fourth roots of unity. This sits uh, over a totally real field. This sits as a, uh, as a levy of a maximal parabolic inside an ambient E6. The Dinkin diagram is, well, the Dinkin diagram of E6. 
and one is deleting this guy. Here, so this is a D5, and this is actually the levy is a spin 10, uh, and with some extra GL1. In this case, you get degree 16, spin 10. 10 is two times five. The spin representation is two to the five dimensional, 32 dimensional, and that breaks up into half spin irreducible representation. So there one gets a degree 16 L function. And here, it's, this is a very exotic example. It's still unclear how it's going to go. Uh, this is an ongoing project with uh, Deline. So this is the scope at this moment to which certain methods, uh, which I'm going to talk about, which came out of Harder's work over the last 40 years, and then my work with Harder over the last 10 years, seems to apply to. And this is just the beginning, as, as far as I can tell. There's some kind of picture of arithmetic theory of Langland's Shahidi L function seems to be opening up. So yeah, maybe I can say one more thing. Uh, I'll just squeeze it in this board uh, without mentioning too much. Uh, since there are many people here who are uh, motivically savvy, there is this conjecture of Deline uh, from 77 in the Core Wallace conference. He formulated this conjecture. Uh, one of his articles in the Core Wallace volumes involves this conjecture of Deline, which is about the L special values of L functions, uh, of motivic L functions. So we thought putting down what these various things mean. M is a motive of some rank, it's critical. Then Delian attaches two periods, and the value uh, at a critical point M is up to quantities in the coefficient field of this motive is a specific power of 2 pi i uh, and one of two possible periods that Delian defines by comparing the Betty and Diram realization of this motive. So there is this very beautiful conjecture which seemingly had explained, not seemingly, which explains every known theorem on critical values. And now the question is, well, there's a huge cluster of theorems coming out. Are they compatible with Deline's conjecture? And the answer is yes. So this is another uh, project of mine with Deline, where we prove some kind of, we prove appropriate uh, period relations. Four periods of motives, together with his conjecture, you know, explains all of these. It's very beautiful. In any case, today's, the purpose of today's talk uh, is to tell you how the shape of the theorem for special values of L functions for orthogonal groups and to give you some idea of how one proves these kind of theorems. Is it division? Does it uh, involve some kind of comparison of motivic period and orthogonal? No, no. So, yeah, so the, uh, it is uh, Deline's conjecture plus the hocus pocus of the Langlands program. There is a dictionary between motives and automorphic forms. Deline's conjecture plus Langlands program plus the period relations which are provable uh, actually very nicely on the nose starts giving you these kind of results. Okay, so now I would like to uh, give you a precise statement. So the main theorem for this talk is my work with Chandrasheel on orthogonal groups. So let me take, uh, let I need n e1, and uh, I'm going to let sigma be a cuspidal automorphic representation of O n n over a totally real field. But in this talk, it's just extra baggage of notations. Uh, as you already got a feel for this meta theorem in Narsimha Kumar's talk, uh, which is you got a theorem for modular forms, there is a theorem for Hilbert modular forms. You got to do it. So in our announcement, for example, is a Q, maybe it's already or totally real. In any case, the work it works or totally real, but in this talk, I'm going to just take F equals Q for simplicity. I'm going to assume some conditions on sigma. I'm going to assume that uh, one, the Arthur parameter of sigma is cuspidal. What does this mean? So this means that the, the degree 2 in L function, amongst other things, is not a product of smaller L functions. Somehow it's honest to goodness uh, degree 2 n. The cuspidal parameter, uh, the author parameter is 
is really a representation of GL2N, which is to be trans the transfer of sigma uh, via Langlands, and you want it to be cuspidal. You don't want it to break up. If it broke up, then this L function breaks up, and maybe the, for the smaller L functions, you could have done something else. So I want the other parameter to be cuspidal. I want the representation at infinity, which is a representation of O, N, and R, but restricted to its connected component. So O, N, and R circle. I want this to be a discrete series representation with Harish Chandra parameter mu plus rho. Rho is half the sum of positive roots, and mu is the highest weight, uh, which has the shape mu1 bigger than mu2. There's a string of integers like this. And finally, I want, uh, uh, I want sigma to be globally generic. Now, I'm quite well aware of the fact that we have a mixed audience here, and you know, in the automorphic, it's some, it has a global Whitaker model. There's a close relation between the conditions one and three. Uh, we need not get into that uh, in this talk. It's sigma genuinely lives on ONN, and uh, the representation at infinity is as good looking as possible. Discrete series representations have cohomology in the middle dimension and, uh, and only in the middle dimension and so on. So there's some, that's what's motivating that hypothesis. I'm looking at modular forms and not looking at mass forms. Okay, I let chi uh, be an algebraic Hecker character of Q. So it has the shape, the idyllic norm to an integer, which I'm going to denote minus d times chi circle is an algebraic Hecker character of Q. So d is an integer, and chi circle is a finite order. It's, so it is, it's a Dirichlet character. So this is the data. I need to have some kind of uh, compatibility between the chi and the sigma. So I'm going to assume a certain combinatorial, <coughs> combinatorial condition involving d and mu, which takes the shape that, let me see if I get this right, 1 minus the absolute value of mu n. The quantity n plus d is bounded by uh, in absolute value is bounded by mu n minus 1. Okay, so this is, I will say more about what is, uh, you know, what role this condition has to play. And under these, for, for these objects and, and these hypotheses, uh, then, the first part of the theorem is if I look at the value at minus n of chi cross sigma, this is the degree 2 nl function, divided by the value at 1 minus this n is the same as this n of O n n, chi cross sigma. This is algebraic and Galois equivariant. And for all tau in the Galois group of q bar over q, if I hit this quantity by tau, L minus n chi cross sigma divided by L 1 minus n chi cross sigma, this is L minus n tau chi cross tau sigma divided by L 1 minus n tau chi cross tau sigma. To even make sense of this, I have to first of all have talked about what is the Galois conjugate of a cuspidal automorphic representation. So if you take a modular form with some expansion summation a n q to the n, then this is like summation tau a n q to the n. This works for modular forms. It basically relies on the fact that the space of cusp forms of some weight, some level has a basis with q Fourier coefficients. That gets jazzed up to GLN, cuspidal cohomology for GLN has a rational structure. This is a theorem of Harder, Walsh, Berger, Clausel. Uh, we have to talk about Galois action on representations of orthogonal groups. For this, we use Arthur's classification, go to GL, apply Galois conjugation, and come back. So some work needs to be done to even make sense of what is tau sigma. It can be done, and it's the, uh, you just think in terms of modular forms, and this is like summation Q, tau a and q to the n. So this is a ratio of a particular ratio of L values, but for a data which is reasonably large enough, and uh, what this implies is you do a little calculation, the critical set for the L function of the sigma twisted by the finite order character, this set, uh, this 
the analog of where did it go? The L through K minus 1. Here is 1 minus mu n, absolute value mu n, 2 minus absolute value mu n, da da da, da till mu n minus 1, till mu n. The way I remember this is I remember this thing, and my L functions are always normalized. The functional equation is normalized as S goes to 1 minus S. The critical set is always symmetric, with, by, by definition, is symmetric with respect to the functional equation. The definition of a point being critical is the gamma factors on either side of the functional equation should not be poles. So you sit down and you do a calculation using the Langlands parameter of such a discrete series representation, and you can write this down. And now, uh, if m and m plus 1 uh, are critical, are in this set, then the ratio of successive critical values for the completed L function is algebraic. And, you know, and I'll simply say Galois equivariant, meaning uh, an equation of that kind. In someone else's talk, I had made this comment about a certain low dimensional isomorphism. If I take uh, n equals 2, so put n equals 2, I don't know where I should squeeze this in. If I take n equals 2, you know, uh, GL2 cross GL2 mod a diagonal GL1 is uh, GSO4. It's an exercise. And uh, so there is some relation between what I'm doing. So these are degree 2 and L functions. So degree 4 L functions for O22, and giving myself twists, believing in this, you should, one should be able to see, uh, retrieve this, and one can. Okay. Okay, so that's the statement of the theorem. And now I would like to spend the rest of uh, my talk uh, giving you some idea as to how one proves uh, theorems of this kind. Any questions? I'm going to kind of change gears. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, split, split, it's split. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry? No. I know, but. <laughs> If the product of two split groups is also split, you know, the, it, it couldn't be 3, 1. No, uh, this is one of the reasons why we want N, uh, O, N, N, O, P, Q will have discrete series if P, Q is even. So one of them needs to be even, not just two, yeah. So O, N, N has discrete series if and only if N is even. All right, so now I would like to spend the rest of this talk giving you some idea of the proofs. So proof, in one line, uh, the proof is you need to study rank one Eisenstein cohomology. For the ambient, uh, ambient reductive group in this, so I'm in this picture. I need to study rank one Eisenstein cohomology for this ambient group. So for this, uh, let me put on my framework. So let X be a perfectoid space. Why not? Uh, I'm going to let G be a connected reductive group. I can work over Q. Think of, if I had a totally real field, think of restriction of scalars something like this. Okay, so that would be the, the group I'm going to work with. I'm going to fix some usual data, everything over Q. I need uh, let lambda be a character of the torus. And now, 
somehow to get rationality results, you have to set up things at an arithmetic le arithmetical level to begin with. So here's my base field. And I take a coefficient field E, which is Galois, and takes a copy of F, okay, and a base change to, and that, that, that field is going to split G. So I take a lambda over there, assume it's dominant for the choice of my Borel, and I'm going to let M lambda E be the algebraic irreducible, maybe absolutely irreducible representation of G cross E. Okay, I'm going to denote SGKF is my locally symmetric space attached to G. So what is this? I'm going to look at GA mod GQ mod K infinity circle KF. So let me define these. KF is a level structure. So this is something which is open compact in GAF. And K infinity is, sits inside G infinity, which is GR is a maximal compact. And K infinity circle is, uh, of course, the connected component of identity. So I, let me not write the standard notation, but a circle is connected component of identity. This finite dimensional representation gives me a sheaf uh, M lambda E is the sheaf well of E vector spaces on SGKF, the standard construction. And the basic object of interest for people who study cohomology of arithmetic groups is to study the cohomology of the space with coefficients in the sheaf. So this is, this is thought of, you know, this, this is literally the fundamental object of interest. Question is, what do you do? How do you study this? So towards this, the basic tool, and I suppose several, several tools, what we use So tools, so we study this using the Borel's air compactification. Oh, uh, I got to say something here. So, well, these are not just, just groups, just E vector spaces, but there's an action of, uh, there's a Hecke algebra for that level structure KF, which acts on this. And because, so th this is, I was having this conversation with Jacques yesterday. Uh, because I'm, I'm, div I'm dividing by the connected component of identity, I also have pi naught of k infinity, this group of connected components acting on these cohomology groups. And this seems innocuous, but here, if you look at uh, this, of course, contains SONNR. SONN is connected as an algebraic group, but the real points is not connected as a Lie group. These Z mod twos drive you crazy. You know, there's a meta theorem that the line between insanity and sanity is, is of, has order two. Uh, so in any case, back to this. So one tool we use is to study the borel fair compactification. So as you know, these, this manifold, well, it need not be a manifold. There might be some pinching. You can always pass to a, smaller subgroup, which is called NEAT, and which is, for which it's, uh, the symmetric space covers this. Uh, I can always do this escape, it's unimportant for this game. Uh, in any case, so this sits inside uh, the Borel cell compactification. This is, in fact, a homotopy equivalence. This is the manifold together with some boundary, and this boundary suppressing notations, this del is stratified, there's one piece, uh, for every GQ conjugacy class of parabolic subgroups. And this being a homotopy equivalence, the cohomology of what I start with is the cohomology of the compactified uh, space. And this, the topological pair uh, of the compactification, comma, the boundary gives you a long exact sequence in cohomology. So I have this sequence. The cohomology with compact supports the construction of the sheaf extends to everything in sight, maps to the cohomology of the manifold, which is in fact the same as the cohomology of the compactification from which I can restrict 
so this is a restriction map for the cohomology of the boundary. So this is the first thing to lay your hands on. And as a matter of, as a matter of definition, Eisenstein cohomology, uh, H dot ice, the sheaf is going to be running through this whole thing, so I'll just put a dash. Eisenstein cohomology is defined as the image of global cohomology in the cohomology of the boundary. This is one definition of Eisenstein cohomology. So this is one tool to use, and one needs to understand the boundary cohomology. And for boundary, so there is some, the boundary is stratified by these various pieces, one for every parabolic. There's a spectral sequence which is cooked up using the cohomology of these various boundary strata, which converges to total boundary cohomology. So there's some uh, E1 PQ term, which looks like the sum of cohomology in degree Q of parabolics whose core rank is P. This guy converges to the total boundary cohomology. So this is the first kind of set of ingredients. And the next is to understand uh, how does these boundary pieces, cohomology of these various boundary pieces, how do they look like? And so these are old results of harder. Uh, the cohomology of del P with coefficients in M lambda. This is the induction from P to G parabolic induction, and well, this group of connected components, pi naught p infinity to pi naught g infinity. This, I, I'll give you a feel for this del p's. So this, this, there's a piece of the boundary which is, uh, which you attach, which Borel said attach. This is a space which fibers over a locally symmetric space of the levy, and the fiber is a symmetric space for the unipotent radical. So that's the kind of thing it is. So it, let me repeat that. This del P it fibers over a locally symmetric space for the levy with coefficient, and, and the fiber is symmetric space for the unipotent radical. And then some letters here will tell you that this guy is the cohomology of the, uh, the base, which is the symmetric, locally symmetric space for the levy with coefficients in unipotent cohomology. And there are these old beautiful theorems of uh, Costant as an annals paper where he studied unipotent cohomology. So you've got to put all of those together, and then you get that this is the induction of the cohomology of the levy with coefficients in something which depends on certain wild group elements, which are called constant representatives, uh, which I won't define in this talk. You can look up my book with harder, uh, or go look up constant, really. Uh, uh, and the coefficient here is this representative W will act on lambda via the twisted action of wild group on weights, and that, the corresponding sheaf, something like this. So these are the sort of ingredients which go into one kind of toolbox which go into understanding these cohomology groups. And you see some sort of relation with representation theory coming in in these parabolically induced uh, representations which are contributing to boundary cohomology. OK. Next, uh, towards, headed, heading towards the proof. Well, where, there are no L functions. I'm just doing, you know, talking some cohomological uh, general nonsense. There are L functions. So there is some analytic theory of L functions in the background. So let me give you a five minute crash course into the Langland Shahidi machinery. Actually, this is just the Langland's part of Langland Shahidi. And you will see, uh, you know, the, you start with an induced representation. So I got all these G, there's a maximal parabolic P, NP, UP. Uh, this is a levy decomposition. What else do I need? Anyway, as, as I need notations, I'll just pick it up. So you start and you take a pi is a cuspidal automorphic representation of, let's say, everything's over Q. 
of the levy and you start with the induction from PA. If you're taking notes, you got to leave some space. I'm going to fill in a diagram here. Uh, you got to start with this induced representation, parabolically induced representation, induced from the representation pi. And in a very clever way, Langlands introduces a complex variable S. You got to use the fundamental weight of the simple root that you delete to get this maximal parabolic. So there's some subtle way in which this S is introduced. This guy, what is it? Bare bones. This is some space of functions on group on GA with values in the representation space of pi, but these are cusp forms in MA. Those are also functions. You know, I kind of push it a little more, and you'll see that these are, well, these are some kind of functions on GA mod PQ. And then, well, you have functions on GA mod PQ. I want automorphic forms on G. You average, and that's called, that's the Eisenstein summation. So this is uh, ice P takes in a function F, and spits out a function which is a function of g, which is summing f gamma g, gamma running over uh, gq mod pq. So you do this, you have to worry about convergence and all that, okay, so that's, anyway. so you do this Eisenstein summation, uh, you get a function on g a mod gq. So I got an automorphic form on g, and now I got this maximal parabolic, I'm going to let q be the associate parabolic. So in this orthogonal group situation, I'm in a self-associate. Uh, the particular parabolic I looked at is a self-associate. If I take GL5 and look at the 3, 2 parabolic, the associate is the 2, 3 parabolic. And then you compute the constant term relative to the associate parabolic, and you'll end up with functions on GA mod Q, Q. I apologize for that. And inside this sits an induced representation, which is some kind of a partner of the original guy, I could induce from G A Q to G of a conjugate of pi, and actually some of the S becomes a minus S. And Langlands did this calculation, and this is the same as the standard intertwining operator uh, going from this induced representation to that. And Langland says in one summer in the 60s, when he had nothing better to do, he computed constant terms of Eisenstein series, and then in this standard intertwining operator, which everything, everything in sight in the bottom arrow factors or uh, all places V, and at a finite place almost everywhere, you evaluate this on the spherical vector uh, here. Well, it's a spherical vector there up to some multiple, and there he saw products of L functions. This Fe circle is a spherical vector left-hand side. At a finite unramified place, Fe circle tilde is the, the spherical vector normalized to take the value one on identity on the right-hand side. And Ri, so this, this is Langlands' notation. These are L functions. So you look at the action of the dual, the Langlands dual uh, of the levy, which is acting on uh, the dual of the unipotent radical. This finite dimensional representation is a multiplicity free direct sum of a bunch of representations. And in the situations in this uh, one, th one detail which is common to my scope was actually there's only one L function. The action of the levy is irreducible on the unipotent radical, M equals one, and I actually have LS by LS plus one. So uh, applied to, so if I take P is this, for Yes, thank you. The local, this is, this is classically, uh, it's, it's called the gindikin karplevich formula for SL2. It is, if G is SL2, this is the gindikin karplevich What is what again? So, so it's a parabolic, it's a standard parabolic whose levy, depends on how you define it, its levy is conjugate to the levy uh, of P. If I, or if I work with the, opposite, working with it, it's, then it's, the levies are equal, they're the same. So if P equals the N, N prime parabolic inside GL capital N, standard upper triangular block upper triangular, Q is the P N prime N with that same notation. 
in the orthogonal group situation, I'm in the self-associate case. Okay, so now the, the crux of the matter is to, uh, one has to view, so the proof involves viewing Langlands, so let me just abbreviate, Langland Shahidi in cohomology. I don't know how many people know the history of Langland Shahidi. So Langlands had done this calculation and then Shahidi was his postdoc sometime and Langlands asked him to look at the non-constant term and in, if you did the non-constant term, then you just see products of L functions and somehow this, that was the starting point and then Shahidi worked on it for 30 years uh, and there's a well oiled machinery of automorphic L functions which goes by the name the Langland Shahidi method. So now, you see the relation between what I start with in the Langlands theory and uh, something showing up in the cohomology of the boundary. So towards this cohomological interpretation, so towards, towards the proof, that beeps when it gets to zero and then there is five. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, so towards the proof, one starts with induction P, now I, I work with the finite part. If you remember the cohomology groups is the finite part, the Hecke algebra is, receives the finite part of the group. So take my inducing data. This, so pi is the chi cross sigma uh, from that board. This sits somehow in a piece of the boundary cohomology. And already here, there is some very interesting combinatorics which shows up, which I will allude to after I talk about the sort of general picture. And this Eisenstein summation, well, so now there is some, this is somehow related, and I won't make it precise here, to the cohomology of the ambient reductive group. And of course, there's this corresponding, by the way, no, there is no S here. When I described the uh, cohomology of arithmetic groups, this H dot SGKF, there was no complex variable S. So what is happening is this S is getting evaluated at a particular point, and to see this induced representation uh, sitting in boundary cohomology, it turns out that minus N is the relevant point of evaluation, and that's, that's where this is coming from. There is this partner on the other side. This sitting inside boundary cohomology, possibly of a different boundary strata, or actually, since sometimes p equals q, it might be the same boundary strata, but somehow it sits a, a little, uh, there is a different wild group element relevant, uh, which is not clear at this level, the way I'm describing it right now. So here there is a, Maybe I'll say something about this combinatorics after this. I'm going to call this I. I'm going to call this I tilde. It's partner on the other side of the intertwining operator. And the main technical theorems to prove first is what Harder likes to call the Mann field principle. This, in this situation, says that the induced representation that we care about and its partner splits off from boundary cohomology. So I plus direct sum I tilde uh, splits off as a Hecke summand from the cohomology of the boundary. Of course, this cohomology of the boundary up to that spectral sequence was built up from a whole lot of other induced representations. And these are two specific induced representations. So one is saying that there's somehow no interference. There's no common eigenvalue between the sum of these two and everything else. For GLN, this is boils down to the jacke shalaika classification of isobaric representations. For orthogonal groups, we need to use Arthur's classification as finessed for orthogonal and not special orthogonal by uh, Atob, I don't know how to pronounce this, Atobi, Atobe, 
uh, and uh, uh, Vita Gun. So once one does that, then the next thing is to look at the image of total cohomology by the restriction map given by the long exact sequence to boundary cohomology, followed up by the projection offered by this Mann and Renfeld. And this image, and this is a beautiful idea which Harder had probably even before I was born in a GL2 situation. This image, think of this I plus I tilde as a two-dimensional space, and the image is like a line. So the image consists of all classes of the form xi, comma, some operator applied to xi. So I know towards the end this might get a little heavy. Think of this as a line in a two-dimensional space. And finally, well, I got a line in a two-dimensional space. Everything is set up arithmetically here. Uh, I can ask for the slope of this line. Slope of this line. For this, I take an embedding of my coefficient system, iota going from E to C, transcendentalize this whole thing, appeal to some Matsushima type formulae involving the cohomology, chief theoretically defined cohomology groups with the relatively algebra cohomology with coefficients in automorphic forms. And out pops this thing that the slope of this line is in fact this guy. L minus N, iota chi, iota sigma divided by. And since I started out with something arithmetic, well, the slope as an the slope of a line in a two-dimensional E vector space is a number in E. So this slope is a number in iota E, is algebraic. And somehow the way it is set up. You can study Galois action on the cohomology groups on this configuration of maps and out pops uh, this. And the, the stronger theorem is, well, one has proved a theorem for one particular ratio for a broad class, allowing myself twists. And then you ask yourself, well, what are all the possible twists I can allow? And this condition, so I, I'm going to spend one minute talking about this condition. This condition puts bounds on the possible Ds I can allow. My mu is fixed. And if you do the calculation, the number of critical points is this minus that plus one. So two mu n minus one. And you will see that this is exactly the number of, so number of successive critical points will be two mu n minus one. And that's this minus that plus one. So this is the number of possible Ds will account for this. So what? Yes, because of my, the, Now they are finite dimension. In fact, they have the same dimension. The, OK, and now uh, let me just tell you some of the sub-problems, and especially this combinatorial condition uh, that goes into proving these technical theorems. some ingredients in proof. The most interesting, philosophically most interesting, is a combinatorial lemma, which says that the following are equivalent. First, the two L values which intervene, I want them to be critical. So minus n and 1 minus n are critical for this L function. This is equivalent to the, that combinatorial condition. So uh, what is it? 1 minus mu n. And these are equivalent. And here you see some very intricate wild group combinatorics coming up, that there is a special element in the wild group which happens to be amongst these constants representatives. Uh, you take the wild group of G, you look at the wild group of the Levy, uh, you look for canonical cosset representatives, and those are these constant representatives. There's a constant representative such that under the twisted action for the inverse, it straightens out mu and D. So take mu and take D, these are the uh, sort of data on the simple factors Put together, it need not be dominant for the ambient group. I want to make it dominant, which I can achieve using 
uh, one of these constant representatives, that's okay. Furthermore, the length of this needs to be half the dimension of the unipotent radical. So some of this is, this is key. So I, this means I got, yeah, in, in any case, I'm done in one minute. <clears throat> this took a lot of work uh, in the GLN situations. For the orthogonal group, this is easy. The number of constant representatives is, you know, you can just handle it by hand. So this is one ingredient. And the other ingredients, uh, there's an Archimedean problem. One has to study the standard intertwining operator at infinity and the map it induces. So this at s equals minus n in relative Lie algebra cohomology. And if one carefully analyzes this, and this is also a lot of hard work, one carefully analyzes this, one sees exactly the contrib contribution of the ratio of the gamma factors at infinity. So that's an Archimedean subproblem to solve, and there's a non Archimedean subproblem to solve, which is at the finite, at almost everywhere we know by Langlands, uh, Grindic, and Karplevich. Uh, at the remaining places, we just need to know that this is a rational, suitably rational operator. So putting all these ingredients together, giving some kind of cohomological interpretation to the Langlands analytic machinery, looking at the image of total cohomology in boundary, and furthermore, some very concrete pieces in the boundary, out pops theorems of this kind. Uh, so th you know, this, this took us 10 years and 200 pages for GLN, and somehow that has given us some wisdom as to what to look for in other contexts, and looks like many more theorems are going to come out. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>